Okay, so I'm going to go through the various uh, reasons, approaches to the pterygopalatine fossa, um, as well as the SPA ligation. So we'll start with the SPA ligation. Does this not have endoscrub? Uh, you want zero to start? Yeah, zero. Okay. So various reasons to do SPA ligation. Uh, obvious would be epistaxis, um, that has been, you know, has failed conservative treatment options. Uh, other reasons would be for JNA uh, or for any other tumor within the nasal cavity that you need vascular control that you presume is coming off the internal maxillary artery. So I, I've started, I've done some pre-dissection on this side. Um, I've done an extended uh, maxillary approach to omega entrostomy, the ethmoidectomy, sphenoid, and frontal have been done previously. So just to orient you, this is the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus or in the nasal cavity. This is the posterior remnant of the inferior turbinate, and this would be the vertical process of the palatine bone. So one of our targets, kind of a suction, please, is going to be identifying the root or the attachment of the middle turbinate onto the lateral nasal wall, and that's going to serve as one of our landmarks for an SPA ligation. The SPA ligation can be done with or without a maxillary entrostomy. I think it's really a surgeon preference and probably disease-specific, too. So we have the posterior aspect of the maxillary sinus is here. We have the root of the middle turbinate here, inferior turbinate, lateral nasal wall. So some of the bone has already been removed in this area for the extended maxillary approach. But we're going to try to do is kind of get here submucosal uh, to identify the lateral wall. And once you've identified the lateral wall, so this is again still that vertical process of palatine bone. It's kind of fractured, so it's not dissecting very cleanly. All right, great. So now we're coming back towards the root of the, or the insertion of the middle turbinate on the lateral nasal wall. The SPA, one of our landmarks is gonna be the crista ethmoidalis. To find the crista ethmoidalis, we're just gonna elevate this mucosa medially. And you'll find a bony prominence as you move back. Now this is towards the arch of the coena, so we need to go up a little higher. We're gonna kinda come through this tissue here. He has a really large vertical height of his maxillary sinus. Uh, there it is right there. So this right here is the exit point and would be the sphenopalatine artery. It can have variable presentations in terms of one, two, or beyond in terms of how many come out of the space. But you really want to establish above and below. So really lift that mucosa up and off and purely. We're coming out towards the arch of the coena here, as well as superiorly to get around this. One a uh, tool that I find useful once I've initially established exposure of the artery is to take a ball tip probe and try to put it around it so we have circumferential exposure around the artery. What we can do first is take an up kerosene and just kind of open and expand this a little bit more. You don't have to do this approach. You could go right to the ball tip probe, but you can expand it with an uh, up kerosene as well too. So if you're using the ball tip probe at this point, you want to establish behind the artery and keep dissecting until you're able to get circumferentially around the artery. And you can see my instrument is starting to show itself here. There's some thick tissue that comes behind it. There we go, a little better. There it is. So now we're around the artery. Different ways you can actually do the ligation. Um, clips are one way. You can bipolar this. Um, if, the, if that's the isolated procedure that you're doing, you don't need to do anything special in terms of reconstruction after you've either clipped or bipolar this, redraped the mucosa, and you're done. And again, you can do that with the maxillary entrostomy. You can do it without a maxillary entrostomy. I think that's really surgeon preference for epistaxis as being the indication for the procedure. But let's say we want to actually go into the pterygopalatine fossa. So again, we have this vertical process of the palatine bone here, posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. You can see the infraorbital nerve over here. I've already done a codball luck on this patient just to show some different views. So I'll kind of show you it from this side as well. Thank you. So from a codball luck perspective, we're looking into the maxillary sinus. This is where we were just established where the artery was. Here's the infraorbital nerve, kind of pointing to it up through this way. So posterior wall of the maxillary sinus here. Pterygopalatine fossa is going to be back through this space here. The anterior wall of the pterygopalatine fossa. 
is going to be the poster wall of the maxillary sinus. So reasons to go in this space are for either disease processes that are in the space. There's important vascular and neural structures uh, as well as fat tissue in this space. The other reason to go in the space of kerosene would be to, for access for more posterior structures. So for example, uh, meningio, or not meningio, schwannomas of the uh, second div division of the trigeminal nerve. Um, if you're going more posteriorly for lateral sphenoid disease or skull-based disease, this can be approached to it. So what I've used here to kind of gain access into the space is I've taken my up kerosene, I put it directly uh, over where the SPA is coming out, and I'm pulling just anteriorly and removing the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. Some people prefer to create a mucosal flap right here. I've initially started it. So this is just kind of pulling the mucosa down off the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. This can be done first um, if you prefer to do that. Um, this can be done, again, either the transnasal approach, what I'm showing now, or you could do it through a Caldwell Luck approach. Another way of doing this as opposed to using the kerosene would actually be use a drill. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to show the drill, but that's another way of doing this procedure is taking the drill to take this uh, space down and expose it. The key here is wide exposure. Um, I'm going to take the up kerosene, please. I'm going to take the up kerosene now and continue to expand this laterally. So this, all this bone can go. There's no uh, critical structures in this area interior to where we are, meaning that the artery should be behind you, so the blunt end or the posterior or the distal end of your instrument is posterior, and you're just continuing to come along the maxillary sinus posterior wall from medial to lateral. The first structure that you're going to encounter is actually the periosteum of the maxillary sinus bone. Immediately posterior to that, once you've incised through that periosteum, you're going to encounter peri or pterygopalatine fat. And what we need to do is eventually kind of incise that fat to gain access into the space where all the critical structures are going to be. Structures in this space are going to be um, arterial as well as uh, neurologic. Uh, internal maxillary artery is going to give off to various divisions of uh, subsequent uh, terminal branches of that artery, including the sphenopalatine artery, the descending palatine artery, infraorbital. Um, pharyngeal artery can potentially come off of that as well, as well as a posterior septal nasal artery. In terms of nerves, the nerves are all going to run posterior to the artery, and that's going to be primarily the ones that we're interested in for today's discussion is the vidian nerve, but also the infraorbital nerve in V2 as it comes from a rotundum. Other nerves that come from that space are going to be the pterygopalatine uh, ganglion, uh, it's going to send parasympathetics and sympathetics onwards. It does provide sensation to the palate uh, as well as to the lacrimal gland itself. So can I have a suction, please? So we're really starting to see now the artery, um, kind of more of its more uh, proximal extent. Yeah. You can continue following this out during your dissections at your stations. So you can see the artery. Have the up kerosene, please? starting to see pterygopalatine fossa fat. I encourage you to take your image guidance and find frame and rotundum, as well as find vidian. Vidian is going to be more medial and inferior, whereas rotundum is going to be more superior and lateral. But you can see this bone comes off really well. The periosteum is actually coming in this dissection, so we've actually already exposed periorbital fat. You can take this up higher, and your next structure you're going to find here posteriorly, as you come through, is going to be into the base of the pterygoid. And you can identify the medial pterygoid plate and lateral pterygoid plate, and I encourage you to do that and keep following it laterally until you find the internal maxillary artery. Eventually, this space posteriorly is going to give off into the sphenoid sinus and, the and then into the uh, middle cranial fossa as you follow it posteriorly. Laterally is going to be the infratemporal fossa over here. Artery is going to be more anterior here. Nerve and pterygopalatine ganglion is going to be immediately posterior to this space. So pterygopalatine ganglion, you can anticipate to find in this area with the vidian nerve behind that. So I'd encourage you to kind of dissect this out, look for the vidian nerve, follow the uh, artery more proximal, find the internal maxillary artery. Rotundum is, is going to be up in this direction. We saw infraorbital nerve. We know that's an extension of that. So continue to follow it up into this direction in here, and you'll eventually find uh, rotundum. Descending palatine artery is going to be right here behind this, so you can dissect that out too if you want to see the descending palatine artery and nerve. And I'll keep dissecting on this. I think uh, we're about to go back to our stations.